Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to episode number 47 of the Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar series. It flows off the tongue a whole lot easier after you've done it more than once or twice. Um, we've got uh, a really cool topic today because, uh, of course, we're a transmitter company, and instead of talking transmitters, we're going to talk receivers, specifically software-defined receivers. And to do that, we've got our resident mad scientist, Alex Hartman. Uh, Alex is the guy that uh, I go to when I want to find out how to do something that I don't even know if we can do. So, Alex, thanks very much, and welcome aboard. No problem. Good to see you again, Jeff. <laughs> Good to be seen. And I've used this joke to before, but it's better to be seen than to be viewed, is what my father always said. Uh, anyway, on that topic, uh, the usual housekeeping stuff. Uh, by all means, we do take questions. We provide answers. Some of them even may be factual. Uh, we will um, do a little bit of mad scientist stuff. As I said, uh, there is a question window in your control panel. Feel free to type your question in. There were also some advanced questions asked. I'll try to address those as we go through. I'll hit every one of them, although one of them obviously may not be able to attend live. Will a recording be available? That brings me to the next thing. This will be recorded. Uh, play nice. And oh, also, while I'm thinking about it, uh, there's a little hand wavy icon on the topic of playing nice. If you hit the little hand wavy icon and uh, you hit, don't hit it if you don't have a microphone, but if you hit it, more than happy to unmute you and make you part of the conversation. Oh, uh, one other thing I almost forgot to mention, if you're an SBE member, an Autel webinar does qualify for half of a recertification point under the SBE category I recertification schedule. So by all means, if you're here today or viewing in the archive, jot it down and uh, take note. Keep it in uh, whatever file you keep track of your research points, which reminds me, again, I've got to start keeping track of mine at some point. I think I'm due in January. So... Uh, you know, the cool thing is when you do several, well, trade, re, real or virtual trade shows and a bunch of SBE meetings and all that other stuff, it, it adds, a, the, the research is a pretty simple procedure. So, you know, if you're not certified and that's what's holding you back, don't let that stop you. It, it's not that hard. So, Alex, you've done a bunch of things and uh, we're going <laughs> to talk about it in more detail later. But, Could you uh, be more specific? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the one relative to this topic is looking glass. And I remember standing in the parking lot of uh, KFAI or KFAI in uh, the scenic metropolis of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if Leah's listening, then uh, we'll give her a shout out. But uh, but yeah, I mean, you were showing me this thing on a laptop that was all, and you're like, look at all these things. And I was like, what the heck is all that? And, and it mm. evolved into looking glass over several yep. years. Yep, um, the, the, the genesis of uh, learning what an SDR was capable of and uh, a, a valued friendship with Leif Clayson turned into uh, my uh, my baby, as it were, uh, at the time. It, it, was a, it was definitely a labor of love to make that happen. Yeah, and I say we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that kind of evolved into a pretty healthy collection of uh, electronic radio receivers, if you will. The wife calls it an addiction, but yes, I guess step one is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> but it's it's not a problem if you're really enjoying it, right? No, it really is. Um, uh, as most, some people may not know I am a ham uh, as well, so I had multiple. Uh, reasons for this is, you know, doing the ham radio stuff uh, along with uh, broadcast stuff and and other you know, RFE type things. RFE, is that's a word now. Um, yeah, it is. So, you know, you can do a lot of things with a, a receiver that's uh, attainable and wide band um, in a hobbyist form. So, you know, things from, uh, like I said, the, the, the hello world of this SDR world is uh, receiving FM broadcast. It's the first mm -hmm. thing anybody does because they're very strong signals, very plentiful, easy to come by, and just seeing how they work. Uh, then you can go into more complicated things like satellite imagery and and um, stuff like that. NOAA satellites, uh, which is what ham radio guys like to do a lot. Yeah. So. And D. Ramos has mentioned in the uh, online comments that uh, Gigaparts is now selling ham transceivers that are uh, software defined. So not oh, just the majority of them are now. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that near the very end because right now we are focused on receivers, but there there is some cool tech going in both directions. You know, you can mm -hmm. send a signal as well as receive. And uh, these things, I mean, we'll we'll we've got some of the higher end ones uh, further on through, but I mean, you've got some on the screen here that you can get off Amazon for like 15, 20 bucks. Yep, um, the RTLs there, um, you know, the Nest DR smarts. Uh, the little USB sticks. It's an RTL SDR, um, and there is a website do devoted to information about these things and news articles. Uh, RTL SDR, just Google it, you'll find it. Um, on the cool stuff that people are doing with them, um, and that was the genesis of SDR into the mainstream, was mm -hmm. that someone figured out that the TV receiver chip, it's a DVB-T receiver chip, uh, the tuner chip could be put into a de debug mode and open it up from four. Uh, 70 megahertz to 1.4 gigahertz completely un unfiltered right and, and use right. it as a tuner and then stepping forward from the the single rtl str i mean looking up above <laughs> that on the left I'm, I'm looking at what looks like an aki sdr multiplexer uh, it's a usb hub with 10 of them uh because the rtl does have a limitation um it, it again it's designed for tv and specifically dvb uh so reliably they can receive two megahertz of bandwidth without it having a mirroring effect or a uh, a noise coefficient to be effective well two megahertz times 10 gives you 20 88 108 and everything mm -hmm. in the middle Very so cool. this is the genesis behind um looking glass really the, literally this is the same thing i stuck inside a pc and we developed against initially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and th that's, I think, the coolest thing about this is that there is a pile of resources on, on the web for, uh, for builders, for, for people that want to do dev work on this sort of thing. So you yep. can create some really cool stuff. Yep. And uh, that comes to, I mean, everybody, I think, is probably, especially if you travel at all, you're aware, you, you're aware of FlightAware, um, mm -hmm. the, you know, the website, the flight tracking website. And so SDRs actually can figure into that. And this is a FlightAware sponsored device. Yes, uh, FlightAware actually makes a, uh, uh, a Raspberry Pi based receiver type system and they give you the instructions and everything uh, to be a listener for it. And they use, uh, ADSB is what the, the, the protocol they use and it's on uh, 1090 megahertz. So all transponders on an airplane have this in the nose cone or somewhere on the plane to tell them location to air traffic control and you know location data so mid-air collisions are you know avoided whatever um, but the the flight aware system crowdsourced uh, these types of things where they you know stuck the rtl with a filter to filter out all the extra noise so it only gets 1090 megahertz and you put it up in the air and you feed their database with up to the second flight information uh, of where a plane actually is. So that's crowdsourced fundamentally based on this. And you can pick up their kit for like a hundred bucks mm -hmm. um, and you can become a feeder. And in some cases, if you're in, if you're in an area where they don't have a feeder, they will sponsor it and send you equipment. Okay. So I'm going to skip back for a second or back a slide. Uh, Douglas had asked, uh, you knew the RTL SDR, what other um, besides the air spy so let's just uh, do a little uh, clockwise around the block i mean we, we showed sure. the aki so uh, start with the sdr play uh the sdr play is a little is the step up uh device uh from the rtl um it's a much better spec um the rtl is an 8-bit receiver uh and when you're dealing with rf um fundam understanding fundamentals of rf there's i and q signaling uh in rf and converting that into a real number gives you the spectrum. Uh, so that, that process, you lose a bit to it. So it only actually is seven bits. Um, so your noise floor goes up. So being an eight bit receiver, these things were only good to, you know, 70 dB down. So you lose mm -hmm. that bit, the noise floor is around 60, 63 dB right. uh, below. So the more bits you can cram, the better the device gets. The uh, SDR play, and this is an old one, they've discontinued this one in favor of a newer version, uh, but this is a 12-bit, so your noise floor is now closer to like 90 dB, uh, mm. because again, you lose that last bit in the conversion process, so it's an 11-bit real receiver. Um, 
but this one in particular, again, is just a receiver, but it also can do multiple bands. So this one, unlike the RTL, which is VHF to, you know, uh, 1.4 gig, um, this one will go one kilohertz to two gigahertz unlimited um, and, and relatively flat. But the downside of that is that they had to split the front ends specifically. So there's, um, you know, wire antenna for AM bands and medium wave and short wave. Mm -hmm. And then you've got SMA connectors for UHF, VHF. Yeah. Um, so you, you do get that. The, the other thing, the important note is that like all receivers, uh, you need a, a, uh, an oscillator to generate it in a very frequency agile one. Um, so, but it also has to be very stable because these things get warm. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, 0.5 PPM TCXOs are in these things for 20 bucks. And in this one for 70, same thing. Um, and they do get more accurate than that, even the more you're willing to spend, so to speak, um, or multiples. And, and this, this, this brings down kind of an important question that ties into uh, William Harrison, who, who attends most of our sessions, but isn't here today. So I'm hoping he catches the archive. But he uh, mentioned that he wanted to try using an SDR to feed a translator interface. Mm -hmm. But uh, and it was an adjacent frequency and just had too much issue with filtering. And uh, mm -hmm. that kind of comes down to, I mean, you could uh, theoretically throw a Yagi and a, or, you know, some sort mm -hmm. of uh, log periodic and a, uh, and a, a adjacent channel filter onto the input of it, couldn't you? And then really, you know, yep. you could, I mean, you could either do it the old fashioned way. You can do it the old fashioned way with front end filtering and stuff like that, which is in the FM band that you, you do almost need a notch filter to get everything else away from you or, or, or an, uh, an FM uh, stop. Pass. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm an analog guy in a digital world here, so that's right. where my mind went first. So, but with the, the advantages of the SDR on a receiver's front end is that you can define in software the scope of those filters. So you can make them really, really, really narrow and eke out every last little bit of spectrum to pull that signal in, run it through a preamplifier if you have to, to pull in a, a, a very distant signal. And yes, you could, you know, if you've got a first adjacent and a translator in, in that market, you know, yes, you could in theory, try and drive it in that way through a pile of software filtering. So I'm sure that uh, it are disembodied voices in the background taking notes for me to remind me to contact William later, but uh, that sure. uh, we may have him uh, reach out because that uh, sounds like it could be a fun little project. Right. So, so the, okay. you know, going around the horn there on a couple yeah. of the other things there. So, you know, the SDR play is another one that's very common. Um, the nice thing about the SDR play is it does have internal or it has connectors to hook up a reference clock to it as well. So you can discipline it to like a 10 megahertz sync generator or a 37 meg or a five meg, whatever your, whatever your lab is referencing to do your RF projects with um, instead of free running. So you can discipline that TCXO as well to a GPS, for instance, for ultimate stability. Um, so in the AirSpy, same thing. I don't even know if these things are available anymore. Um, it, it's made by a guy who wrote some software uh, called SDR Sharp, which has become the Windows uh, de facto SDR program to play with and learn. Um, not it's it's powerful, but not very powerful. I mean, it, it'll get you where you want to go. Um, but this again is a an eight bit receiver versus a twelve bit. Um, so this was the kit that uh, started a lot of in interesting things because it too has the input for um, GPS discipline oscillator. Um, the one on the right side there is the newest one I have in my collection. Uh, Pluto Plus SDR. Uh, Analog Devices makes uh, an SDR development kit, and it's called the ADLM Pluto. Uh, the reason why it didn't really strike me as interesting is that the start frequency is 300 megahertz. So it's well above broadcast, so it kind of loses interest to me, of course, um, but it's a nice SDR. Well, the chips that Analog Devices has, there's three different ones out there. So someone took that platform as a development platform and a reference design and respun the board to have um, a different chip that's more wide frequency. So this one is, uh, you know, 70 kilohertz to four gigahertz um, with dual receive. So it has antenna diversity. So the cool thing about having multiple inputs versus the other guys 
is that now if I wanted to, I could take a signal from uh, an unwanted station, put it in and run it through a filter in software to filter it out through the receiver front end and spit it back out to my software to pull it back out and go the other way. So you can do a lot of crazy filtering with this. Um, and this one actually has a transmit component as well. So you can actually use it as a modulator or a small exciter. Granted, there is no like low pass filter or anything. They have to do that on the outside. You can do some of it in software, but the radios are you know, still just little 10 milliwatt uh, outputs. So you probably do still need external filtering and get, get cozy with your soldering iron. Um, but what makes this one unique uh, is it has an ethernet port on it. So I can put this anywhere and pull that data off the network. Um, instead of having it be USB and needing a PC nearby. Now all I right. need is just this box. Now in the questions, Douglas mentions that the ADLM or eight, I can't speak. ADLM, yeah. uh, Pluto can be modified down to 70 megahertz. Yes, and this one has been modified. Uh, not If you modify the ADLM Pluto as you get it from analog devices, uh, the noise floor goes up and curves pretty high on the bell curve because you're basically taking the, the, the ADC out of band. Um, so it does have reflections and noise. This uses the one of the other chips that natively does it. Um, so the software mod for the real one, yes, you can do that. This one actually has the real chip in it. Um, the only place I know to get these things is um, AliExpress or geekbuying.com. Uh, they're a little less known companies you got to trust you're buying stuff from china uh, but no big deal for me I, I, all this stuff usually is uh, they do everything that we want to do and they do it better than i can uh, so that's why i picked this one up and this is about 300 bucks for that one um, then you got a couple of more of the board style ones uh, for development kits and, and what have you and things that you know this is what graduated looking glass from a usb rtl to these types of boards um, the one in the middle there, the board style is called a Blade RF. Uh, and it is a very, very powerful, it has its own FPGA built in. Uh, so if you're a VHDL programmer or dabble in FPGA programming, you can write code to be super, super fast directly on the board. Uh, so all your filtering and uh, receive or transmit functions could be done in FPGA and the USB just spits out only what you want. Uh, instead of actually having software do the heavy lifting for you. Uh, you can have the hardware do it. Um, same with uh, the other two there. Uh, those are another flavor, which is uh, Lime Microsystems, Lime SDR. Uh, and this one uh, has, it was originally developed for like cell phone interference generation and testing and stuff like that. Uh, very, very cool lab grade stuff. Uh, it has six receive inputs, four transmit outputs. So it'll do MIMO. Uh, all, it, it, as long as it's within its spectrum frequency range. Uh, things to keep in mind, like the Pluto SDR uh, says it'll do 60 megahertz, uh, mega samples per second. So 60 megahertz of bandwidth at once is visible uh, to wherever you tune center frequency. So plus or minus 30 megahertz. The problem is, is that it's USB to the, the, the chip inside is only USB 2.0. So it, you really only get about a 14 megabit effective or megahertz of sample effective out of the ethernet. Where USB 3 shines is that that's a five gigahertz interface or five gigabit interface rather. Uh, so you can shove a lot of data through these things. And the Lime SDR is capable of the same 62 mega samples per second at a 12 bit or 13 bit depth, 12 bit real. Um, has the multiple clock ability. This is, uh, and again, has that FPGA on board. So all of the all the special sauce is inside that little chip, and uh, they make a mini version as well. Uh, if you don't need that big of a heavy thing, and this one does um, 20, it does 50 mega samples a second, same bit depth, has a clock ability, and instead of having the, uh, the the mini 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 connectors on the board, the PCB there, these actually have little SMAs on them, so they're a little easier to interface with. Um, Really nice little boards. Uh, same processing chip on here as on the big guy, but the big guy uses a different USB spec interface. That's really the only difference. So you can do uh, with the, the myriad of collection or addiction that I have here, sky's the limit uh, and so is the floor. Uh, DC to daylight as they say, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, Douglas does mention that Arrow, Mauser and DigiKey carry analog devices. 
Uh, yes, they do. That's, that's worth noting. Um, and uh, let's see, oh yeah, just a, the, the one thing that I'm getting from this so far is that it's a good idea to have an idea what you really want to accomplish before you get into it. Because that's going to tell you, like with anything else, exactly what tool you need to do the job. Right. You're walking into a factory, essentially, with these boards, and you have all your raw materials, but you have no vision of what you're doing. Um, and, and like I said, the first thing a lot of people do with these things is learn the software, and the hello world of this world is receiving FM broadcast. Um, you know, so you can get familiar with what the signal looks like at an RF domain, what you can do to manipulate that signal once you have it and acquired it, uh, how to decode certain things like subcarriers, um, double filtering, um, you know, uh, bandwidth and, and stuff like that. And this is where you start having to learn some software. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this here is a block diagram. And, and, and those who aren't familiar with GNU radio. Uh, GNU Radio is a software-defined radio interface programming system, and it's WYSIWYG, so you get a block system here of list of devices that you want to emulate, and it creates it in software. It's like MATLAB, essentially, um, but a little bit more user-friendly, I suppose, compared to MATLAB. Uh, but just if, it, it does the same thing. You set your variables for certain things, you know, uh, options. And then you have your blocks, you know, so you got a, a resampler, a signal source, a low pass filter, band pass filter, pre-emphasis, de-emphasis, you know, uh, your syncs, whether you're recording it to a file or sending it to a transmitter to actually generate a signal. Uh, but you have to convert the math, too. So you got to go from a short to a float or a vector to a stream, um, you know, things like that. How do you convert I and Q to real numbers? You have to do all that. They give you the tools to do it, but you have to know how to do it. Um, there's plenty and, of you, tutorials on how to do this. And that's one of the things I was going to uh, interrupt with. Um, when I put these pictures in, I went through and, and Alex sent me all the pictures. So we, we'll blame him at the content uh, is uh, in a in, well, I don't think any of it's inappropriate. But uh, anyway, um, when I put the pictures in, I did try to, wherever possible, include links for build sites where where yep. you can get some more education and background on this. So yep. by all means, you know, the the foremost authority on that because this is this is your your development world. So you, this is where you come up with your vision. Say, I want to do this. Chances are you're not the only one who's wanted to do that, but the way you want to do it may be different. But that means that you can go, go use the templates and start moving things around and see what happens. Right. And at least you've got a, a known starting point, if you will. Right. So, yeah, I say you'll see that as we go through this presentation. So if you see anything you like, grab a screenshot or catch the archive later. And, uh, you know, you can certainly get something to play with there, too. Um, but as you can see with this, this is a FM transmitter block. Mm -hmm. That is that is that is a, a stereo FM transmitter with a signal source and spitting it out to uh, where did one of them go? Any one of these really? Um, you know, you got this one in particular is using USRP, which is more of an industrial lab SDR. Uh, a lot of people use those for making real products. Um, you know, so they have to mock it up before. This is this is the RF version of rapid prototyping. Right. If you think about that but, I mean, when you get down to it at this level, whether you're transmitting or receiving is just a matter of which way you make the conversion flow. Exactly. So, you know, it, it's all an AC to RF converter when you get right down to it or vice exactly. versa. So um, that's uh, that's pretty cool. And there are and there are a lot of prepackaged products. And I, mm -hmm. I picked this ELAD one just it, it's kind of cool and convenient and uh, it, it's pretty pretty readily available they're like three four hundred bucks i think on their website but mm -hmm. um i mean it, so it's already built and it contains some software yeah yep uh, elad makes their own software suite to work with their soft uh, their, their radios um you can use anything but of course to get the feature rich you have to use their software uh because oh, sure. it's written for it um so you know on this screen you can see your spectrum your waterfall eqing for the audio if you want to eq some audio like say you're doing single sideband work in ham radio you want to get that fuzz out of there eq them out notch filtering down there on the bottom so i'm notching out the rf signal and then right next to that and the, on the bottom right is um the baseband so you can even notch further into the baseband uh, and mm -hmm. pick out specific signals like you're doing CW work or beaconing for satellites or whatever else. You can you can get pretty tight in. 
um, yeah. S meter up top, frequency selector, whatever. Yeah. And this one is uh, an, an ELAD uh, software picture. I did not include the uh, the website link on this. I didn't find it on their site in the whopping five minutes I spent looking. So that's uh, that's on me, but credit to ELAD for this one for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, yeah, again, you can uh, you can do things to be as simple or as complex. And, and on the simple side, this is this is a pretty basic level one. It is. Um, and that's just an FM stereo receiver. Um, the thing that makes it a little bit more difficult is it actually is showing the full FM spectrum in a heat map waterfall. Uh, so you get signal intensity based on color, so on and so forth. Um, you know, that's really it. You get a volume slider, frequency select, gain select for the RF AGC, you know, and then you can see the tabs there. And this is all programmable within GNU Radio. You can, you create these things in this interface. So you got station channel, left plus right, 19 pilot, so on. It's diving down. Mm -hmm. um, and these now are all this, readily available on GitHub. So if I don't uh, swap my laptop too many times, this comes back to um, what William's question was earlier with uh, the uh, translator pickup. I mean, you could, with with any plain vanilla SDR receiver, you could uh, set up your filtering pretty tightly if you needed to and mm -hmm. uh, create something like this for your, for your translator feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, these guys are making the software filters in this world are 0.1 kilohertz, 100 hertz. Or, or even 50 hertz, you can get really, I can pick out sonar pings if I wanted to, if I had a big enough amplifier, you know, you can get into the dirt and into the noise. I successfully with some of these boards, I have a TV slash FM antenna, an old wine guard sitting on the roof of my house. And it's made for distant signals. It's the medium one you can buy off of like TV fool or solid signal. Um, because I live 50 miles away from Minneapolis, so I have to pull in my TV stations and FM stations from there. Uh, but hooking up one of these SDRs just to see how far it would go, I've pulled in stations, you know, not even, you know, doing FM DX or, you know, Skywave bounces or e-skip or anything. Um, I can pull in Duluth radio stations because I can pick them out of the noise. And yeah, they're 90 dB down, but I've still got 10 dB to work with. Mm -hmm. So I, with that 10 dB, I can run it through a software LNA, bring up it through the noise floor and actually decode FM stereo from 200 plus miles away. Right. And I mean, shout out uh, the, the uh, folks at Innovonics, of course, if you want a prepackaged solution, you got the Aaron 650 and things along mm -hmm. those lines. So th there are a lot of uh, oh, yeah. highly sensitive and selective uh, receivers out there. I believe that and, uh, the Innovonics stuff is all SDR based now. And here's a question where if anybody from Xbury is listening, they can just plug their ears and go la, la, la through um, mm. through your answer part. So Eric asks, has anybody put up software that derives an HD constellation display and analog digital time alignment from a good SDR output? Go ahead. Tell me the answer. We I, And I already know the answer. We've had this discussion before. Yes and no. Uh, yes, there are software decoders for NRSC5. Uh, which is the spec HD radio is based on. It is public information, had to be pa paper published, and, and the, the entire software suite is based on that. For time alignment purposes and spectrum and constellation, uh, Gadoo radio is available, go ahead and make it. Uh, no one has done that yet. Uh, I have, um, you know, I can probably put the, you know, help on GitHub, but I choose not to just out of respect for Xperia because uh, it's my own world uh, that I use it for. Um, it's not meant to circumvent anything, but yes, there is software out there that has been derived and be able to receive using the $13 RTL. So, you know, again, it all comes down to the code when you get right down to it. I mean, receiving the signal is easy, uh, displaying the, uh, the specific parameters. If you know what you're looking at, it's not that big a deal. It's just right. a matter of it's just a matter of time and speaking of if you know what you're looking at and just a matter of time so <laughs> when i first met this guy he was bright yellow and uh sitting i think you've still got one sitting behind you over there somewhere yep yeah. and uh and, and as i say when when you very first introduced me to it we were standing in the parking lot behind kfai sort of behind your truck and you're like hey you should check this out mm -hmm. and uh you showed me this collection of pieces that were plugged into a laptop and the, you know they, they weren't really nicely boxed up at all at the time 
and, and into that and then, yeah yeah it, it, you know you got to start somewhere and just you know proof of concept the whole thing using off-the-shelf components what i'm really good at is taking all these things that i find uh, on random websites and be like hey that's pretty cool what can i do with that um yeah. i work for st cloud state university part-time and my boss there actually has a budget for me that actually has a line item things alex wants to play with um <laughs> So it's, you know, what does that do? I don't know. Okay, what are you going to do with it? I don't know. Okay, here. Okay. And nine times out of 10, it turns into something. At um, some point, yeah. At some point, or it, it gets shelved for a little while until the next piece comes along. And then I remember, hey, I have that and put the two together and come up with looking glass. Right. Um, you know, so like I said, that was several years worth of, of uh, you know, code development with Lave, hardware, trial and error. You know which ones worked, which ones didn't, which ones worked well, which ones didn't work well. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the, only, the the thing you can't get away from is time, right? Uh, right? So how how did I know that this was going to be a survivable product? Well, I just had to run one forever. Uh, yeah. That's why my yellow one that says uh, PT01 Prototype 01 is still in my rack running today. Mm -hmm. And so. that's one of the cool things you talk about. Uh, I mean, sometimes you do stuff just to see if you can. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after a little while, you'll figure out if you really should. But right. uh, an excellent example, and he's not with us today, but another one of our, our frequent viewers and occasional guest, Shane Tovin with uh, with EMF, is uh, mm -hmm. quite frequently um, showing off some cool new toys. And they got a 3D printer recently, and I looked at it, and it does uh, CNC, it does milling. And yeah, it, it was only a it was only a matter of time. I knew it was coming, but a, a CNC milling machine sitting on your desktop now. I mean, well, you know, how and, cool. a, and a friend of mine has one of those too. That he got one of the big, big ones. You know, he he can do four by eight sheets of wood, but mm -hmm. instead of being a horizontal table, it's turned up about you know eighty five degrees, like it would be for you know you go to Home Depot and have them cut the wood. Mm -hmm. They lay it up this side this way so they can make aisles of them and do rapid prototyping and, and wood milling in a, sh a very small area. Wow. Uh, very cool stuff. I had a friend showed me some stuff. The, the family does a, a business like that with uh, both wood and um, and metal for I think it's for the modular home industry. Right. And uh, and they do some really cool things down in Mississippi with that. So, uh, mm. yeah, it, it was just but the, again, that was the industrial size to, to see this mm. on, a, on a tabletop size was really, yeah, like right up behind you. Yep. So that's, um, I uh, bought that specifically because I had an old AM phaser that used nylon knuckles to connect the knob to the roller inductors. Mm -hmm. And those nylon adapters, you know, they get brittle over time. And, yeah. and they break. Well, I, I mean, instead of calling around and, you know, our, our friends, uh, I love the guys, I love Tom King down there at uh, Kintronics, but I'm not paying 300 bucks for a piece of nylon. Uh, so I got this out, found an STL file and printed one out using PVC and still on the air to this day. Yep. And, and that's one of those. So what's going to drive my purchase? And uh, this is just me being, uh, well, you know, using technology to solve a problem with a more expensive solution. But uh, Real Boss wants to replace all the drawer pulls in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. yep. hey, you've, you've seen our kitchen. It's been a yep. while, but all told, there are 95 drawer pulls in that kitchen. Yep. I mean, the that's doors. an expensive proposition. At ten bucks a pop for the one she wants, so yep. it's like you know I could spend five hundred dollars on one of those cool little things. So we're kind of digressing from the topic, but uh, but, still, but yeah, I, again, it, it, I it's use the same basic premise to make looking yeah. glass. You know, I I sourced the chassis, custom made the three D renders and modeled it, and found a company actually north of Nautel uh, mm -hmm. that rapid prototypes metalwork. So I paid them to make the original yellow chassis, powder coated and everything else. And that's what made the product at the time. Right. Um, you know, I, before, before that, it was a pile of parts on my bench, much mm -hmm. like today. Um, you know, I, everywhere over here is just a pile of parts until I put it in a pretty box yeah. um, and, and clean it up. So, but mm -hmm. you got to get to that. You got to go from there to get there. 
Right. And and that's kind of, like I said, you, you look at a product, you see a need, and then you come up with a solution that, uh, you know, it, it may not be a quote unquote orthodox approach to something mm -hmm. but but then the next thing you know it is elaine makes the comment about the uh, drawer pulls that that's why i make the big bucks and if she had any idea what the uh, renovation um mm -hmm. I, I can't say budget um what the cost Expense. projection for the estimated renos coming up to casa de welton over the next two years yeah i'm gonna have to sell a few more transmitters <laughs> um, let's or just look at that there you go or looking glass and uh that kind of and this is where and, and this comes back to this whole thing with the sdrs because looking glass of course hardware base is software defined receivers yes but it's what you do with that data that makes mm -hmm. the difference and it's all in the presentation of course um so That's you know here's <laughs> right i mean who wants to sit and stare at ones and zeros and put it together in your head or you know figuring out the pretty pictures or, you know, fig figuring out phosphor persistence of an oscilloscope on an LCD in software, you know, uh, leave that to the programming guys who know how to do stuff like that. <laughs> and that's why Leif exists. Um, mm -hmm. He knows how to do stuff like that. I knew how to take this little board right here and generate the RF and it spits out ones and zeros. And, you know, I can take that and shove it into his software here and just read that stream of data coming from that FPGA and RF front end and create this uh, and then split it apart, you know, because I'm taking every piece of that RF data, uh, you know, and breaking it apart. You see the RF, you see the spectrum oscilloscope, you see the baseband, the audio level, the RDS. And, and, and again, down there on the bottom right, there's that filtering again, because I can change the bandwidth of the composite signal, the IF, or I can fine tune the tuner uh, for that specific thing, because the SDR is capable of seeing 60 megahertz of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Now I limit it to 25 in, in looking glass, because we only care about the FM band and just slightly above and below. Right. So if you go to the next page there, the you'll see exactly what I'm talking about is there. So mm -hmm. I look at 25 megahertz of spectrum at once, and all we're doing is slicing it up 30 times. So I can right. dive in to 30 different signals at once within that same swath. Uh, I so, can also see at a glance a couple of HD stations in the in the yep. band. Yep. Uh, here at home, a lot of people are HD. Um, I'm outside of Market 15 in Minneapolis, so there's some of those in there too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, th these are you know, the, the abilities of, if you can see that much data, what can you do with it? Well, mm -hmm. my idea was to pick apart the FM band as best as possible. And I right. thought I was pretty successful at it. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of what it comes down to is being able to break it all down. And, and this kind of comes back to what Eric had asked earlier. I mean, if you can see the HD sidebands like you can on uh, on this one, then there is no reason you couldn't deconstruct the signal and, and set up time alignment or whatever, whatever. At that point, it's just a matter of whether you want to do it with licensing and, and make a, a really cool singing and dancing, or if you want to go a little under the table and uh, do something that may be a little less supported. And uh, It's not a technical problem. It's a legal problem. Yep. And, and that's, I think, the big thing to remember about this is that there are going to be situations like that. Very um, much so. Now, a little side note, and this is not related to Looking Glass in any way, but Nicholas has asked how do current studio to transmitter remote control links factor in new transmitter developments? And I think that's almost a two-part question because I'm not what, sure what a studio to transmitter remote control link is specifically. I so know what he's SCL, talking about. I understand. Yeah, there, there, there was back in the, not too many people use them nowadays because everything's gone IP. Uh, but you would use like a 450 megahertz RPU to talk back to the studio oh. and you could send commands over like a serial channel on your STL to like a remote Burke or Dabacom gotcha. Gotcha. and then get your verification back on, on, on the TSL. Um, yeah, and I mean, these days between SNMP and just straight IP control on, on a lot of yeah. boxes, that's sort of that slowly going there's, away. There's, there's other things that a lot of people have done that are kind of innovative where using an SDR, I've seen people actually inject subcarriers as a control signal. It's a very low bandwidth signal 
but mm -hmm. it's all you need to know is a status, you know, is, is the light on? Well, yeah. that equals one. Mm -hmm. And then you inject that into your um, 67 kilohertz. If you're not using, you know, our, uh, a subcarrier, it's a low speed bandwidth system. It's funny you said that, and as you said that, Mark uh, Voris is typing or bring back telemetry on an SCA. Yep. So, so yep. that's exactly what a lot of people are doing on mountaintop sites that are very remote, and you know the only IP connectivity they have is at the bottom of the mountain in town. Mm -hmm. You know, generator sites that don't have IP type of things. How do you monitor it? Well, yeah, telemetry over an SCA, and then yep. put that, receive that at the bottom of the hill, plug it into some guy's internet. And off you go. Right. Now, I made the joke earlier about being the analog guy stuck in the digital world, but you say that, and the first thing I think is Max Connect. But of course, mm -hmm. then again, you run into the situation, you got to have uh, cell coverage. Yeah. And, and if you're on top of, of a time, mountain in Wyoming, that's not always possible. Sometimes you get above the cloud, so to speak. And yep, yep that can be an issue. So that's, that's another good point. All mm -hmm. right. So scooting past your baseband. So we showed a bunch of SDRs already that are. Uh, I wouldn't say entry level specifically, but uh, dev class running from a couple of yeah. tens of bucks to a couple of hundreds of bucks. And then if you want to, we can go into the several thousands of bucks. Yep. These are the big boy toys. Um, Edis Research is one of the people who basically pioneered the SDR for industrial and lab grade. Um, it's basically where it started with uh, Win Radio as well, where it was the other company out there. People may remember Win Radio from, depending on your age, uh, back in the day, you could buy the FM tuner for your PC, and that was kind of their in. Well, they kind of expanded that and basically put hardware front ends, like what you'd find in a Spectrum Analyzer, complete with giant metal casing onto a PCI card, and you could stuff that in and use that as Spectrum Analysis, lab-grade generation, so on and so forth. Edis took it a step further and created their line of products, uh, the USRPs. And these ones here are... The, the X310 is uh, the poster child for lab grade um, in, in that respect. It, it can see a ridiculous amount of bandwidth. It can transmit on two different channels. It's two physically separate SDRs. It's got gigabit networking, multiple gigabits. Uh, I believe they have a 10 gig interface now for this because when you're transferring I and Q, it's a large amount of data. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about looking glass for a second, that whole swath of 25 megahertz, if you were to send that out as raw IP data, um, that's 900 megabit per second. That's not going to happen over my cable modem. No, no, no. It, it writes 94. No, it's 900 megabit. Yeah, 900 megabit a second. And it writes a file out at 90 megabytes a second. It's it's yeah. heavy. So doing this over a network is not for a faint of heart. You're not doing it over a cable modem. You have to convert it into some other format to transpose. Um, right. That's why a lot of these things have USB on them or multi-gigabit Ethernet or you know so on and so forth. All of these devices, for instance, are USB three uh, because of a five gigahertz or five gigabit, sorry, uh, interface. So yeah. you can do a lot of things, and the, this one in particular is sold specifically for like lab and government work. Um, notice it only has two tuners on it, uh, but it does have a GPS I/O and stuff like that, external reference, PPS sync. Um, again, it's lab grade. Uh, this is yeah. what things like Nautel use to generate and make new things. Yeah. And I mean, I haven't said that. I'm going to say when you get to the end product, when you when you figure out what you really want to do, there's nothing to say you can't limit your sample size. You know, instead of sending me the whole band, if I decide I'm monitoring this frequency, send me the five kilohertz around it or 50 yep. kilohertz or 100 kilohertz. Yep. So, you know, you can definitely tailor your bandwidth and tailor your throughput the same way. Yep. Just requires a uh, programming knowledge, which, uh, is, like I said, that's why life exists uh, for me. Uh, but yes, if you are good with programming, yeah, you, you can slice and dice this any which way and spit it out however you want. You can even do that in GNU Radio. People have done it. Or, you know, like I said, VHDL and put it on an FPGA. So I can barely make my uh, smart house turn on the furnace at the right time of day. So I'm going to uh, defer to the experts for that one. Sure. But but yeah, absolutely. It's uh, one of those things that you can do as little or as much as, as you've got the time and the money and the uh, ability to learn. Yep. Um, and speaking of that, then we get into the big boys. 
Yep, and I've got a little version of that right here. And it's only a single radio versus the quad and they make an eight channel version of this. And what, what makes this one interesting is this one was developed and designed for 5G uh, development uh, and signal uh, analysis because there, nothing existed for it. Uh, so they had to make their own. And this was crowdsourced, um, believe it or not, uh, to develop this because uh, let's be honest, to even get into this arena for guys like um, Agilent or Nokia or Rody and Schwartz and stuff like that, this is a very heavy front end lift. Um, mm -hmm. It's very expensive to develop these types of things. As such, the products that they put out in the marketplace to monitor the 5G system is equally expensive. Uh, right. If you want an honest to God 5G monitor, spectrum analyzer monitor uh, that decodes all the bits and bobs that is in the 5G carrier. Um, the cheapest one I found, I think, was like eighty-five thousand dollars, and that was the base model. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, what makes this one a little innovative is that yes, you see on the, that card, mine's only got one, uh, but on that card, there's four, and the the amount of bandwidth each one of those cards can handle is an astronomical number. It's like two hundred and forty mega samples a second per card. And each of those cards is like its own little uh, mini computer, isn't it? Yes, it's its own SDR. The, P the the backplane that they're all attached to is nothing more than a PCI Express switch that switches really, really fast to line them all up in order and present it to the computer for a software-defined radio, uh, like a new radio or whatever implementation you're using. So it, it's switching between these radios very, 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 very fast to spit it out. So if you're looking at here, 240 mega samples times four, you know, you get two gigahertz worth of spectrum you could, or, or gigahertz worth of spectrum you could look at here with just one board um, at, you know, 16 to 18 bits worth of depth. So you're, for the cell phone guys, you know, if you've ever looked at your cell phone and you think you're sick, you have five bars, cool. Go look at what the actual DBM is. It's like negative 96. You know, it, it's in the noise. Same mm -hmm. with 5G. So these things have to be super duper sensitive to pull this stuff out from behind radiation from the sun noise. Right. Yeah. So that's where these things come into play. And that board being crowdsourced, I think mine was like 300 bucks for the single one. You know, mm -hmm. and these are, you know, in the grand scheme of things, affordable. Um, yeah. You know, this is probably like 1500 bucks for that development kit. No software, you get to write it, but the hardware's available. Yeah. And now for anybody who express format, you can actually take the carrier board out and the card and stuff that into a laptop by itself. <laughs> so for anybody who does have an interest, the uh, top link in that uh, slide is the uh, crowdsource link for this specific device. Mm -hmm. um, the bottom link is a kind of cool article about how SDR is being implemented in, in 5G. And, and it talks a lot about the MIMO devices. And so uh, I had to Google it, but tell me about MIMO. What is MIMO? I mean, multiple in, multiple out. Uh, so it's multiple. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, like your Wi-Fi. When you go buy a Wi-Fi router, it says two by two, three by three, six by six. That's MIMO. Uh, so it's doing channel bonding. Uh, you know, so it'll combine three different receiver radios that can only see, say, 200 megahertz, and then combining those three. And then they can also do what's called beam forming, because they can electrically control the the radio can electrically control the antennas to say this you're over there. I'm going to beam form the signal to go that way. Mm -hmm. um, so these things can get uh, very directional, very, you know, direction finding is a big thing with using SDRs because you can do stuff like that. Right. Um, a little harder to do with the RTLs compared to the Fairwave stuff, but y you can do it. Um, this is, uh, if you've seen a modern FCC truck, this is what they're using. Hmm. So there you go. That's uh, what happens when you've got that kind of budget. Um, this uh, might go a little beyond what uh, I'm going to get away with. Well, again, you've heard what real bosses got uh, planned for renovations. So, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I can sneak a 13 or $14 SDR receiver into the Amazon shopping cart. Nothing happens. But uh, right. if I start to go into adding three zeros to that, then we may have a situation. Yeah, you um, end up with a trouble. Now, the cool thing about the SDR technology, and I was making this joke easy 15 years ago i think uh yeah it was about 15 wow time does fly when you're having fun mm -hmm. uh, but uh these days more and more 
I, I make the joke that we don't build transmitters, we build uh, computers with really high power, high frequency sound cards. And to that extent, more and more, we're building software to find transmitters at this point. I mean, obviously to amplify it and to combine it, that uh, that requires technology in the analog domain. Uh, as soon as that uh, barrier gets overcome, then it'll just be a matter of telling the transmitter whether it's AM, FM, shortwave, and how many watts, depending on how many blocks you stack together. All right. Yep, and that's right there. That's a board that comes out of a VS1. That is the controller slash modulator slash exciter board. So mm -hmm. it's all defined in those little chips there, like the analog devices, the ADC. There's a Xilinx FPGA, a couple of DSPs in there, and that's what generates the transmission signal to feed the modulator to convert it from the digital bits and bobs to an analog signal to feed those pallets that go out and make the RF. Yeah, and I've got to uh, throw the uh, little plug in. He's not online right now. I don't see him on the uh, on the guest list. But Rich Parker would be uh, pinging me right now to remind me that uh, changing that battery is a pain in the rear and it should be accessible. So, in your in your mad scientist design, well, of course, then then the challenge is uh, not breaking the little clip. So that's uh, that's a whole different story. Nothing a Dremel doesn't fix. <laughs> So side note for the people that don't know the backstory, anything we build, Alex can break. Um, of course, anything that he builds, he can break too. So it's just, you have, you're, you're a well-skilled, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, Stress my kids say I'm a, I, I'm a really good fixer. <laughs> highly skilled stress tester we're going to yep. go with that yep i mean so, on my vs1 that coin cell turns into two uh two little wire leads and i mount the battery externally yep and i mean that's uh one of those things that the newer products i mean the gv series the uh, battery is rear accessible so uh yep. yeah people told us and we did listen and and that's i think that's kind of where i was really going with this is that uh i i think most manufacturers will we do listen you know uh, now sometimes we act sometimes we don't and sometimes we don't act very quickly but that's a whole different discussion um but definitely if you've got something that that's niggling at you like like and, and it could be the piddly little thing like man these things are driving me crazy and then you don't even think about it again well when that happens send an email to me jeff wilson who's making sarcastic remarks in the chat uh or whoever and and say look you know it'd be really cool if you guys just never did this particular thing again or if you did do this particular thing because that's i mean i can't speak for obviously all manufacturers or even most but uh, i know at, at Nautel we kind of live and die by by what folks tell us they want to see mm -hmm. you know so the the bulk of what we do is is based on on user feedback and right. that is my plug we are going to for I think the second time in 47 episodes finished near on time today. Wow. I know. I mean, that's... Uh, we can't keep that. We can't do that. Let's go over. Let's talk about okay. a couple of other things you can do with this. Uh, so, you know, like I said, the, the, the people who have latched onto this are the more technical-minded in the RF world, uh, specifically ham radio, worldwide. Um, so you'll find that, like, uh, you know, I'm sure a bunch of guys here are hams. Um, the dream radio for a lot of people is the Flex SDR, uh, like a 6700, but you know, it's a $7,000 radio. It's a nice radio, but it's expensive. Um, what people have done with the, the first thing a ham did with these little things, they can see two megahertz of spectrum, which is a lot of space in the ham world. Uh, so you can, you know, use this as a pan adapter to go find and hunt your signals on field day. Um, what a lot of people have also done with these things is um, satellite communication. Uh, you can receive satellite data like GOES and Meteor and, and um, all this stuff and, and get, you know, tele, telefax stuff. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Um, we call it, uh, what is it, is it the dead hunting uh, in satellite world where there's all the stuff that's up there that's just beaconing that has been decommissioned, but is still in orbit, you know, it's, it's in decay orbit. Well, you can still find them because NASA has to know where they are in case they run into something. So yeah, you can see that too. That's a thing. 
Um, I've seen people use these as up converters to go, you know, to gigahertz range to do mountaintop communications because they can. Uh, you know, uh, one quick question, you, and you'd uh, mentioned this before, but you, you talk about how they're uh, used a lot for direction finding. Mm -hmm. And um, how hard would it be to come up with something that somebody could take a $20 SDR dongle, plug it into a laptop and track down, say, a pirate station? Well, and that comes into a couple of things. You know, hams are really good at making antennas. It's what we all do. You know, you never met a spool of Romex we didn't like and, <laughs> and turn it into a receive or a transmit antenna. I mean, show of hands, how many people have lit their gutters? How many people know what I said? <laughs> uh, My gutters know. are plastic, so that's not going to work, but uh, well, there's right, flashing but, on the eaves. So. Right, but the HOA and the wife says, no, you're not going to have a, a tri-bander, you know, 40-foot antenna on top of the roof. you got to figure it out, right? But, uh, you know, so same thing here with direction finding. With two RTL SDRs, and it all comes down to RF theory and design, and those in the extra and above class of uh, ham radio, have all gone through those tests and understand this. So it's DU, it's desired to undesired. You take one that monitors your undesired and create one that is your desired and boom, you've got a Yagi, one side going one way, one side going the other, start turning around, where does the signal get stronger? Mm -hmm. Boom, direction finding. Uh, add a GPS in there, you got compass and coordinates. Yep. Oh, the two good things here on the ham side, Elaine mentions that the hams also have a lot of dedicated SDR locations. So if you can't hear someone from your own antenna, you can tune into one of theirs. Yep. Uh, uh, WebSDR.org is a thing. Um, there's tons of them all over the world. If you don't want to get into this or you want to experience over the air stuff remotely, uh, there's a program called SDR Console. That is another very popular SDR program for hams. Uh, that allows you to even remotely place these devices using a Raspberry Pi. Uh, mm -hmm. And it does RTL TCP. Uh, and it spits the RF back to this application. So if you've got one at the cabin or cottage for the Canadian people, uh, and, you know, a couple hundred kilometers away, and you go back home because you live in that HOA, but you, the, out in the woods, no one cares if you've got that trying banner up in the trees. Cool. Use it that way. Mm -hmm. um, that's what a lot of people do is that they'll remote the antennas. Um, same with FM. You can do the same thing. Put this at your FM site and RTL TCP through a Pi, show it back to your station, monitor off air. You and can do that. that. Uh, comes back to coincidentally enough, the, the next comment, John Van Milligan had mentioned they use a $20 dongle to decode RDS on the computer at the transmitter site. So yep. you can actually tell at the transmitter whether you're transmitting the RDS signal and if it's right. And affidavits, too, if you're selling the RDS information. Um, the thing you have to watch out for on these SDRs is that the in high RF environments, specifically AM and FM, uh, they are very, pro, are, are very susceptible to front-end overload. So you will get imaging, you will get artifacting, you will just blow the thing up. These things are not very... That the cheap ones are not very well protected. Yeah, there's a steering diode on the antenna input, cool, whatever. But that's what will pop, and at 20 bucks, you just pitch it, buy a new one, right? Now, um, how hard would it be to put a uh, notch in front of it, or a you know, an attenuator, a tuned attenuator? That's exactly it. You know, just like your spectrum analyzer, you have to know what you're looking for in your environment. So if you put a 10 dB attenuator on the front end of here, it works just the same as it would for your spectrum analyzer. So you do have to experiment a little bit to figure out because these have um, the nice thing about these ones in particular is they have an RF AGC, but sometimes it doesn't go low enough. So, you know, when you hit zero dB, there's no attenuation in here. It's just a gain. So you do have to attenuate on the input and then let the LNA add the gain back. Um, there are converters. I had one around here somewhere. <laughs> don't know where it went. Uh, but there's what they call a ham it up adapter, um, and it's a trans transverter. So what it does is, you know, these things are VHF only, so 70 megahertz to, you know, 1.4 gigahertz. What if you want to listen to AM? Well, they make a, a, a transverter that will move the AM band up into like the 125 megahertz range. So then you can use that to listen to your AM frequencies. Uh, or, you know, if you want to do HF or VHF, uh, low band, you know, ham radio stuff, that's what they're used for. Uh, mm. Really cool devices, um, and it's just a mixer and, and an LO, and it just shifts the thing up. Now, 125 megahertz, you may run into some aircraft stuff, you know, here and there, uh, so you got to watch out. But luckily, the AM band isn't all that big, so it fits pretty nicely in between a lot of that. 
Yeah. And so the cool thing do. too about uh, something like that is whether you're looking at AM or FM is just the code in the device. Exactly. It doesn't care because it's just feeding you RF, I and Q. Now, that being said, uh, other side of this thing is not just this hardware. It is what you plug it into. So if I'm sending 90 megabytes a second of data to be decoded, demodulated, stripped apart, and presented to you, it requires a lot of CPU. Um, and that's why these FPGAs uh, exist. So I'm not doing this on my company provided i5 with uh, the uh, with the SSD at about 95% no. capacity already. No, uh, even for Looking Glass, which I do utilize the FPGA quite heavily for, uh, with custom firmware for it, I still need an i7 8000 series running at about 40% CPU to do what it does. With even with this chip, if I didn't use the FPGA and did it in pure software. Um, I would load that CPU to about 75% doing it all in software. So right. it gets heavy um, to try and, you know, when you're dealing with like, you know, um, ham radio, two meters or, you know, uh, 20 meters even in single sideband, that's pretty light lift. You know, you're only looking at, you know, a couple of kilohertz of signal, you know, or two megahertz, you don't need a whole lot. It's when you're starting to figure out how to do Wi-Fi hacking where you need to see 60 megahertz of spectrum at once. Right. Uh, 5G decoding, uh, even 3G or, or old, um, you know, CMTS stuff, uh, or even SCADA is a popular thing because RF has now become the final frontier for hackers. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's good to know your air surroundings in that respect. What's around you? Uh, there's a, a conference every year called DEF CON in Las Vegas. Uh, I've been to it a couple times um, because... Uh, you know, the, the bank hires the safe cracker to, to secure his bank. I'm right. kind of that same guy. I have to know what's out there to know what I have to build, yep. um, you know, and how to best, you know, advise the people at Nautel to make the next best thing. Insert object here. Uh, you know, so if I go to things like DEF CON where literally you do not bring your own cell phone, never right. bring your own cell phone. Um, I've done this demonstration actually at uh, certain conferences where these SDRs, because they are so powerful, I can make this look like a cell node. And I'll put a radio in the back of the room with my laptop hooked up to a, a, a max connector, a cradle point, some kind of a internet, and your phone sees it as the nearest tower. So it latches onto it and connects. Mm -hmm. And now I've just controlled your phone. I made the entire room ring at once because I sent basically a 911 page. And they didn't even know what happened. Yeah. This is what happens at things like DEF CON is that, you know, they can get in there and they know what you're doing. So you have to be a little careful of your surroundings. Know that the, these people are, are out there. Um, and RF has very much become the wild, wild west for these people. Um, yeah. SCADA is another thing. You know, your water meter, your air conditioner, they all talk back to the power company because they can control the thermostat essentially in um, conservation times um, here in the U.S. anyway. Uh, so that is a thing, um, you know, broadcast control. How many people remember the RDS Tattletale systems for the truckers? Um, yep. You know, where the trucking companies would rent out your uh, RDS and give you the pretty call letters, but they were using it to find truck locations mm -hmm. uh, and distances back before GPS and two-way data. Same basic premise. Yeah. So, and you can sniff those guys just the same still today. They're out there. So the, the short answer is, as with everything you put on the internet, just automatically assume somebody's watching or exactly. listening. Um, um, you know, everybody has the best intentions, but there are people out there trying to make a buck from it. So, right. Well, and I mean, you know, on the internet side of things, we saw that when we all woke up yesterday morning to discover that, uh, you know, one of the bigger providers was uh, under a ransomware attack. So mm -hmm. it, it definitely happens. Um, and that, I think, is the other thing to be aware of more and more as you get into this stuff, uh, the security, both of the system you connect it to and the device itself is going to become more and more critical. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, uh, you know. um, I I go telling people that SDRs are really cool. Use it with caution. Yep. Well, it's like everything else. You know, as soon as you connect something to the internet, you've just attached a big old bullseye to it. So right. Uh, 
the big thing here, the takeaway there is like the Wi-Fi rule, right? Um, or satellite TV rule. Um, I live in Northern Minnesota, which is also known as Southern Canada. I technically can receive um, Bell Media satellite mm -hmm. because it, RF doesn't care about boundaries and borders. So right. it bleeds over a little bit, right? Yeah, I can do it, but legally I can't mm -hmm. because I'm not a Canadian resident and it's not available to US customers. Right. Um, doesn't say people don't do that, but you can do that. Uh, uh, it's the same as 20 years ago. I mean, we used to drive south of the border to pick up a, a Dish Network dish instead of the Bell Express View dish because yeah. the, the American satellite channels were better. Right. And same thing with Wi-Fi. You know, you open up your phone and you see all these networks, right? Because it's constantly scanning to see all these networks. That's perfectly legal to do. As mm -hmm. soon as you click connect and you don't have permission to be on that network, you're breaking the law. Right. Remember that. Same with SDRs. You know, just listening in the RF doesn't care about boundaries. If it's not, you know, if it's encrypted, whatever, you know, that's that's why the hackers love this is because it's in the air. It doesn't care about boundaries. Um, so protect yourself and know your surroundings. Right. So on that note, we come very close to our usual 10 minute past two o'clock. See, once you light Alex up, you can get Alex going for, for well, we've spent mm -hmm. hours talking about this stuff in parking lots, let alone yep. seated in comfortable chairs. Right. So um, as with all Nautel webinars, this one will be archived. Uh, if anybody had to skip out early or is coming in late, then uh, you'll get a link usually in the next 24 hours. I think it tells me that it's one o'clock Atlantic time tomorrow and uh, it, it's not usually wrong about this stuff. So uh, I'll, I'll take his word at that. But uh, you'll be getting the, um, the, the link to tell you where the archive is, whether you were here or not. And uh, we've got a Waves newsletter, again, coming out at some point in the near future. I keep saying it. Maybe it'll happen. The, the problem is, see, I've got material for this one already, so I'm pushing Fiona to get it done. But mm. uh, she works She works on a very specific time frame. Um, obviously, the YouTube channel, that's where you'll find the little customer service how-to videos. You haven't made any of those yet. No, not yet. Uh, there will be some forthcoming specifically, like looking glass manuals are going to be more of a video series. Cool. Instead of a paper book. Well, and that's the funny thing. And here's something for y'all to come back to us with in the feedback form. Uh, just a, a little off the cuff question for anybody left hanging on. Um, more and more, we're finding people will watch a three minute video before they'll pick up a manual to read it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Let me know. Yes, no, center sideways. Uh, you can either do it in the survey form as a comment, or you can uh, throw me an email direct at jwelton at nautel.com. Uh, that's the kind of information that we, again, make a lot of decisions on. Um, mm -hmm. Other online resources, Barry Michigan's Broadcasters Desktop Resources, there's radiolist.net, pubtech.org, crtech.org for the Christian radio folks, um, broadcastengineering.info for uh, a lot less chaff and a lot more info. There's uh, tons of stuff. And Facebook pages, oh my goodness, we got Facebook pages. It doesn't matter what you want to talk about, there's a Facebook page. Come on, we're going to do a TikTok, not a not tell official TikTok? Oh, shush. Just don't. No, we're not doing a TikTok. All right. On that note, we are 10 minutes past the top of the hour. Alex, I want to thank you very much for coming. No problem. And it's been a whole lot of fun. And folks, uh, anybody who's uh, managed to stick with me through that last little preamble or postamble, I guess, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Have a good night now. Bye now.